Oh God, may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of our hearts, may they be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So it's been said that human beings can live for 40 days without food, four days without water, four minutes without air, but they cannot live more than four seconds without hope. Now, whether that is true or not, I find this statement compelling because what it does is it makes me think about this emphasis on, on how hope is so central to who we are as human beings. Hope matters a lot in our lives. We need hope. And there's a, a neuroscientist out there by the name of Tali Sharat who really uh, studies this, and, and he agrees with me. He suggests that hope is a, such an important marker for our survival, and, and his studies reveal how, how actually hope is hardwired into our, into our brains. His research shows, and in some instances of this, his research shows that college kids who are more hopeful, they have higher GPAs, and they're more likely to graduate. Hopeful athletes, they perform better, they cope better with injuries, and they have a greater mental adjustment when things get really, really challenging for them. Dr. Sherrod's studies uh, among the elderly, and this is perhaps the thing that struck me the most, is that elderly, uh, in, that, in that sample that he did, they, they revealed that those who reported feeling hopeful were more than twice as likely in a follow-up study to still be alive than those who felt hopeless. And then there's a psychologist by the name of Dr. Shane Lopez, and he's considered to be the, the world's leading researcher on hope, and he concludes that, that hope isn't just an emotion. It's an essential factor for us to live well. And what I would suggest for all of our consideration today is that followers of Jesus, Christians actually have an inside track on this reality of hope. Christians should know better than others about the effects of a God-oriented hope in their life. And I like how St. Paul speaks about this in, in Romans 4.18. He says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. And then in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. In Romans 8, 37, it says this, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Hoping against hope, all things are possible. We are more than conquerors. These are biblical promises of hope, amen? amen. And so church this morning, I believe that God wants something for you, wants something for all of us, and, and whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever your challenge, God desires to show you and reveal to you his hope. Because no one is hopeless whose hope is in God. It's one of my favorite statements. No one is hopeless whose hope is in God. And our readings for today teach us quite a bit on this topic. In fact, hope is at the center of our Old Testament passage from the book of Ezekiel where, where dry bones that are, that are dead actually take on flesh and, and come alive. Hope is proclaimed in our epistle reading from Romans because of our life that we have in the Holy Spirit. And then from our, our gospel reading in John that you just heard, Mary and Martha's brother Lazarus was, was called forth literally from death to life from the tomb. And, and at the sound of Jesus' voice, his, his heart began to beat, his, his lungs filled with air. Church, no one is hopeless whose hope is in God. Amen. But the difficulty for us as we live our lives in real time with real struggles is that, that hope seems to have this, this ugly companion. You see, hope is actually without substance unless we have a challenge. And what do I mean? I mean that if all is well, there is actually no need for hope, right? If you think about it, it's challenges and hardships are, are actually this catalyst for us to have hope. And I believe some of you who are here, the skeleton crew worshiping here this morning in this building, and those of you out there, some of you listening and watching need this message, need hope today. 
Because of the coronavirus, your employment has changed. Some of you who are in retirement and you've watched your investments and your, your savings take a big hit. If you're single or widowed, then you're, you feel the effects of, of loneliness. If you're a part of the youth group, then, then your missions trip has been canceled. Graduations, high school and, and college are not happening anymore. It's a unique time. And it's pregnant with challenges. But this also means, because it's pregnant with challenges, it's pregnant with hope. As I said, hope needs challenges. Hope is refined. Hope is purified. Hope is distilled in the midst of hardship. And looking at our lectionary text from Ezekiel, we know that the Israelites, they were actually in captivity. And our, our Romans passage tells us that our life in the Spirit was, was made possible only because Jesus Christ endured the cross. And Lazarus, well, he, he still died, right? His family and his friends were still confused and filled with sorrow before he was brought back to life. And I think it's honest. It's honest for us to, to recognize up front that it's not uncommon to wrestle with feelings of hopelessness or discouragement when we face tensions and when we face challenges. But as I said just a little bit ago, I believe this morning that God wants to remind you that it is possible to get to a place where you can believe that there's no such thing as a hopeless situation. God wants us to get to that place where we can believe that there is no such thing as a hopeless situation. So now what I want to do is I want to, I want to dig into God's word on the matter of hope. And so open your Bibles wherever you are to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. And we're going to pick back up in, in verse 1 and hear it again. Verse 1, Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. Verse 2, he led me back and forth among them, and I, I saw a great many bones on the, on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, he said, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Now let me just pause here for a minute, stop here for a minute, and, and mention how this verse looks a lot like to me, it looks a lot like to me when Jesus was led into the wilderness for 40 days of temptation. Right after he was baptized, if you remember that story, he was, we are told that the Holy Spirit actually led Jesus into that place of trial and tribulation. So like Jesus in the wilderness and Ezekiel in the valley, our challenges might also, might, they might look counterintuitive to us. But they may, they may actually be counterintuitive opportunities to see God work and for us to, to move from a place of hopelessness to a place of, of hope. Verse 1 says that God brought Ezekiel. He brought Ezekiel, just like he, the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. And, and, then it says, and then it says, he set him in the middle of a valley full of bones, not a lush pasture, not a bubbling brook, not a gentle breeze glowing through a flower-filled glade. No, that's not the vision that we have here from Ezekiel. This, this vision that is God brought Ezekiel into the middle of a valley that was desolate and filled with death. And then what? And then what? Did God just pull Ezekiel right out? Not a chance. That's not what we read. What we read here is he actually had him walk around in this space. And not just once. The description in verse 2 is that, that God led him back and forth, back and forth. He didn't pull him out. It's not a pretty scene. And as it turns out, the struggle was, was not actually limited to this dream, this vision that, that Ezekiel had. It was actually real. You see, the prophet Ezekiel was actually taken captive in, in Babylon at the age of 25 following the second invasion of Jerusalem by King Nebuchadnezzar. So the, really what's happening in verses 1 to 3, it's more than a vision. This depicts a reality. There is real desperation going on and, and there's real reason in real life for dis discouragement. And if we jump down to verse 11, we're told that the, what the bones actually represented. God said to Ezekiel in verse 11, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We're cut off. And I, I really can't help myself when I read this passage. When, whenever I read this, what I think of is I think of Indiana Jones. 
I think of this, this, this movie where Dr. Jones falls into this, into this trap and he tumbles down into this, into this cave or this space. It's filled with all these human remains and, and bones. And if you've seen this mo- movie, then you know this really freaky and scary scene, right? There's bones everywhere. And, and when he finally kind of catches his balance and he's, he's laying there in this movie, he stops tumbling and right in his face is this, is this human skull looking right at him. It's super freaky. Similarly, what Ezekiel is shown here is not pretty. It's scary. It's a place of destruction. It's a place of desolation. And it's a place of death. There might as well have been a a skull in the story looking right at Ezekiel. When verse 2 describes the bones as dry, it actually means that they'd been there for a while. Things had gone badly for the Jewish people in captivity and and the situation was was dragging on and on and on. It had been five years since Ezekiel was taken into captivity. Five years. But get this. This is really cool. The name Ezekiel actually means God will strengthen. And so it seems from the very beginning of his life, as he formed in his mother's womb, and before the the, the name was spoken over him, that Ezekiel's destiny, God will strengthen, was to inspire and strengthen an entire generation, a people who had become literally a heap of bones. Ezekiel had a mission. He knew no one was hopeless whose hope is in God. And so when God asked the question in the first part of verse 3, Ezekiel Ezekiel, Zeke, can these bones live? Ezekiel's response is telling. He doesn't make assumptions. He goes beyond himself instantly, immediately, and he points to God's character. In particular, he points to the sovereignty of God. He says, sovereign Lord, you alone know. In other words, he puts everything on God. Everything he puts on God. And this is the first point of application for you and I this morning. When we feel hopeless, God is able. When we feel hopeless, God is able. What surrounds Ezekiel is an impossibility. Dead bones coming to life is a crazy, ridiculous concept. Not unlike our greatest sources of disappointment or or discouragement when things look and feel impossible for us. So when God asks Ezekiel the question, can these bones live? The answer from the human vantage point is pretty discernible. The answer is no, it's impossible. But when you feel hopeless, remember that God is able. And Ezekiel demonstrates the belief that that if it can be done, and and if it is to be done, then God is actually the one who's going to do it. Ezekiel's words in the second part of verse 3, and soon his actions in the verses that follow, demonstrate surrender, faith, and trust, and ultimately hope in the ability of a God who is able. And another way of looking at this is to say that, that Ezekiel had this conviction for possibility. It's the, it's the substance of faith and hope. No one is hopeless whose hope is in God. So again, our first point of application, when you feel hopeless, please remember that God is able. Second point of application this morning is this. When you feel hopeless, I want you to remember that you are able. You are able. And when I say you are able, this is what I mean. You have a role to play. In this passage, you've got to notice that that Ezekiel was called to speak these things into existence. He was asked to participate with Almighty God. And I think it's crucial to notice that that Ezekiel, he did not dilly-dally in this moment. He didn't hesitate to do what God told him to do. The second point of application is when we feel hopeless, remember, you are able. We are able. Look at verse 4. God told Ezekiel, prophesy to the bones. I love that. Prophesy to the bones and say to them, dry bones. And don't hear my word. Don't hear Ezekiel's word. Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Verse 7 says, and he did just that. 
I prophesied as I was commanded. God asks Ezekiel to participate. God asks us to participate. Same pattern happens again in verses 9 and 10. Verse 10 says, I prophesied as he commanded me. In both instances, stuff happened as Ezekiel spoke it. And we've got to notice together that Ezekiel had an obedient and submitted heart. And it makes me wonder, it makes me wonder, could it be that our places of hopelessness are actually prisons? Hear me now. They're actually prisons that we have created for ourselves because of our lack of obedience and submission to the promptings of God. Could it be that your hopelessness or my moments of hopelessness, are in those, in those moments you're submitting actually not unto God, but you're submitting to doubt? That you're not being obedient to God, but you're being obedient to fear? Forgetting what God is calling you and me to do in those moments. Remember our second point of application. When you feel hopeless, you are able. Amen? And I want you to know that God always sees the potential in you. Even when you don't see it in yourself. God calls us beyond what we could ever imagine of ourselves. God calls us and beckons us to be a hope-filled people. I like what Bob Goff says. He says, courage, it doesn't mean that you're not afraid anymore. It means that our actions are not controlled by our doubts. I'm going to repeat that. Courage doesn't mean that we're not afraid anymore. It just means that our actions are not controlled by our doubts in other words, we shouldn't be paralyzed into inactivity. Courage assists hope. And so the lesson here is that when God prompts you, it's good to get on board. It's good to move. It's good to start walking, even when it's hard to believe, and even if you're, you're feeling somewhat afraid. Okay, so quick recap. Point one, when you feel hopeless, remember that God is able. Point two, when you feel hopeless, remember you are able. And the final point of application for us today is that when you feel hopeless, I love this, remember that you have help. God is able, you are able, and you have help. Church Ezekiel, he didn't have an easy task. The people that he was ministering to were depressed the people that he was ministering to were defeated in battle. They were ripped away and removed from their homeland. They were, they were mocked by the people who had conquered them. There was nothing easy about Ezekiel's situation and his mission. In fact, his destiny was actually to, to provide inspiration to a people that didn't even want to be inspired he was trying to find hope for, for folks who felt it all was hopeless. He was offering encouragement to a people who in many ways they didn't even want to be encouraged. And yet when we look at the text, what Ezekiel recognizes, our third point of application, yes, God is able, yes, we are able, but we also have help. And the Bible tells us that the hand of the Lord was upon Ezekiel. Come on now. The hand of God Almighty was upon Ezekiel. And remember, church, it is the hand of the Lord. It is the, the Holy Spirit himself who also leads you and also guides you. Amen? Amen. It's the hand of the Lord. It's the, it's the Holy Spirit who will strengthen you. It's the hand of the Lord. It's the Holy Spirit who will, who will sustain you. It is the hand of the Lord, who the Holy Spirit, who's going to encourage you toward hope. You have help. Not only does verse 1 suggest that the hand of the Lord is upon us. Verse 14 tells us, I will put my spirit in you and you will live. And I love our New Testament passage from Romans chapter 8, verse 6. It says it like this. The mind that is governed by the spirit is life. We have help. Church Ezekiel lived he stood firmly in God's strength in the face of difficulty, in the face of discouragement. He trusted in God's plan for, for redemption for the people of Israel. And guess what? It had happened. Israel was restored. So our three takeaways. When you feel hopeless, 
Remember, God is able. He is sovereign. And he has ability to do all things. Point number two, when you feel hopeless, remember you are able. This just involves our our obedience and our participation with God. We have a role to play. And point number three, when you feel helpless, oh, thank the Lord for this one. You have help. We're equipped because God's hand is upon us and his Holy Spirit is within us. Amen? So church, you've got to remember, when you feel hopeless, God is able, you are able, and you have help. And I, and I just have to say this before we wrap things up here. Hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is confident living. <laughs> hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is confident living. Woo! Amen. And facing the future knowing that God can and knowing that God will do something good, not not only in this life, but ultimately, even even when things don't go the way that we might want, but the ultimate hope is is in the life to come. So again, before we close, I want to pick, I want want you to, just a little participation here, a little something to chew on, something to, to take away and live into this week. I want you to pick one thing in your life that you feel most helpless and hopeless about right now. Wherever you are, whatever your circumstance, and take 10 seconds, what is one thing in your life that you feel most helpless and hopeless about today? And I want you to imagine this thing Maybe it's related to COVID-19. Maybe it's related to a a relationship. Maybe it's related to a a job. Maybe it's related to finances. Maybe it's related to your your faith journey. And what I want you to do is I want you to picture that one thing as a stack of dead and dry bones that continues to decay in lifeless desperation. And today, I want you to be Ezekiel. Ezekiel. This week ahead, I want you to be Ezekiel. I want you to give that stack of bones, give it to God and say like he did, God, you alone know if these things can can live, oh God, because you are sovereign. And church, I encourage you to spend time praying life and hope and speaking over that situation. And as you do this, I believe, I prophesy that God will answer. Amen? You've got to remember that the Spirit of the Lord is upon you as it was the same as the saints of old. As a child of Almighty God, His hand is over you. He sings over you. He delights in you. You do not need to stay hopeless because your hope is in God. Remember, He is able. Remember, you are able. And remember that you have help. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.